welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul with my wonderful co-host, Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hello. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> no chit-chat for us today because we got to dive right in because we need like two hours with yes, our next guest exactly. and we really only have about one. <laughs> so uh, let me intro uh, this wonderful doctor and uh, we're just going to dive right in. Great. Our guest today is one of the most influential leaders of the plant-based movement as he is focusing on both individual and systematic change. He's an author, clinical researcher, physician, adjunct associate professor, nonprofit founder, and wait for it, an accomplished musician. <laughs> he has penned 20 books, many of them New York Times bestsellers, including the 21 Day Weight Loss Kickstart and the ever famous The Cheese Trap. He also teaches at George Washington University and founded one of the most impactful health-promoting nonprofits to date, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, otherwise known as PCRM. Under his leadership, the committee has lobbied for more humane and sustainable practices in the research and medical fields since 1985, working to take animals out of the equation. Dr. Mardarn and his team focus on prevention, not prescription, when it comes to chronic disease. And he is paving the way for a healthier, more ethical, and sustainable plant-based future. There's so much to discuss, like I mentioned, so we are going to dive right in. Hello, Dr. Neil Barnard. Joining us from Washington, D.C., right? Hey there, Dotsie. Hey there, Alexander. Yep, I'm, I'm here at our office in Washington. It's great, great to see you. So, so good to see you. So, I just found your um, past fascinating. And I know that you have probably been on a thousand podcasts um, and a lot of people like to just kind of jump right into uh, the, the food stuff, especially when it, we had, we are talking, uh, we're talking veganism, we're talking plant-based. Um, but I, I found it too fascinating just to brush by. So if you'll, um, if you'll, if you'll, if you'll indulge me, uh, I, I'd like to go into a little bit of your history because it's just, uh, it, it, a lot of it seems to me that it really shaped the world. Work that you do today as well. Um, you grew up in a time of monumental change. Um, you've said in different interviews that music was a way for, um, you know, kind of one generation, your generation to rebel against the values of the generation before you, right? So your parents' generation. And it was also a time of um, a, a lot of, uh, of unrest of people standing up for what they believed in, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement was going on. And you said, uh, I read during this time of your life, that suddenly your black and white world turned to color for you. What did you mean by that? Well, um, uh, Dotsie, what you said is really true. I grew up in North Dakota, and um, my uh, father had grown up in the cattle business, and his father and his father, as far back as it, we could trace, um, and it was time for maybe that to change. Um, but as a kid, I hunted, I um, drove animals to slaughter, um, and obviously we ate meat and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I went through a number of experiences that maybe widened my horizons a little bit. But as you said, it was also a time when, when everything was changing. The Vietnam War was happening. Um, my own generation, my own year, was the first year that we had um, a draft lottery. Mm. Um, where they would pick your birth date out of a thing and basically would, depending on what your number was, you would end up in Vietnam or not. Um, and many of us had concerns about the way the war was, well, the whole, the whole thing. Um, also, it was a, time of great, a great time of civil rights. Um, I remember, uh, of course, when Kennedy was killed and then when Martin Luther King was killed and Robert Kennedy was killed and all of these things were uh, very impactful. Um, and these and other things kind of shook me out of some of the values that I that I grew up with. I also lived overseas for a little period of time, and and when I got back, I just started to rethink things. and And certainly, our relationship with food has to be central to that because that's a whole lot more than just what's on the plate. It has to do with your attitude about the planet and and health in general, and those that we share the planet with. So, going to medical school, you you went and got a degree in psychiatry first. Is that correct? Um, well, yes, you, you, you go to medical school and you get just an MD degree, mm -hmm. um, which, and then after that I did a general internship. And then after that I did a residency in psychiatry, and then later on I switched into the Department of Internal Medicine at GW, where I'm on the adjunct faculty now. 
Wow. So you've covered the entire human body. So <laughs> <laughs> Head to toe. And well. we want to talk about actually a lot about your psychiatry background because of b behavior change is such an important component of your work. Um, but I want to ask you, did being in medical school uh, shape your, your dietary uh, outlook or did it change it at all from your meat eating, milk drinking D North Dakota days? I have to say, the big thing was the, just the year before I went to medical school, I was um, working at a hospital in Minneapolis, and my job was in the basement of the hospital where there were no windows and nobody had come to clean up in probably months. Mm -hmm. um, there was the hospital morgue, and my job was to help out at autopsies. So one day a guy died in the, in the hospital. Um, of a heart attack, probably from eating hospital food, but that, that's another issue. <laughs> so anyhow, um, the pathologist did the autopsy to determine the cause of death, and my job was to help him to do that. And so he cut a big chunk of ribs off the front of the chest and put it on the, on the table, mm. and that, sh that opened up the heart. And he wanted to make sure I saw everything, because he knew that I was going to go to medical school. So he said, Neil, have a look at the coronary arteries. They, they're called coronary because they crown the heart. And he sliced one open and said, you know, stick your finger in there. And so it felt like concrete. He said, that's your bacon and eggs. That's atherosclerosis. And then the carotid wow. arteries that go to the brain, same story. The arteries to the legs, all of these had this massive atherosclerosis. So this is kind of eye-opening. Um, and at the end of the exam, he left, and I had to clean everything up. So I put the ribs back in the chest, and I sewed up the skin. And when I was finished, I went up to the cafeteria. And they were serving ribs for lunch. And I looked at it, Jeez. and it smelled like a dead body, and it looked like a dead body, and I just couldn't eat it. I, I didn't become a vegetarian on the spot, but I knew I wasn't going to eat that. And as time went on, I started to associate meat with with death and, and these dead bodies. And I don't know if you'd call that ethical or health or, or what. But, it just is. They're um, dead. <laughs> I just realized, you know, this is not something to, to go on your plate. And as time went on, of course, uh, all the other pieces of this start to, to fit in. But that was my, uh, I might say, my introduction to all of this. We know that many people don't make decisions off of just, uh, you know, facts and figures. You know, it's, it's, it, has, it has so much more uh, to do with um, the interweaving of how they grew up, right, and culturally and familially and all, all sorts of different aspects. But there, you probably come across people almost every day that have those hardened arteries, like the ones that you just spoke about, and you saw them with your uh -huh. own eyes. Why does knowing that that's the case and they know that is in their arteries and they know that that can kill them, what do you hear mostly is the, the barrier that even though, yes, it's facts and figures, it's their own facts and figures, right? That's, it's happening inside of their body. Why are they resistant to changing their diet? Well, um, I have to say, you know, I was one of those people too. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, when I was a medical, medical student, I ate meat and I don't want to shock you, Dotsie. Um, and, and Alexander, you're both health conscious people, but I used to go into the hospital gift shop and pick up packs of Merit menthol cigarettes and I would light them up. I smoked too. Because Here we go. It's okay. Oh, really? I did. 12 yeah. years. Oh, really? 12 years. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. All right. Well, oh dear. We're not well, then, No, people. you we guys are an inspiration cancer. then. Um, yeah. My head of surgery would buy Marlboro's and he'd light up and we'd go to the doctor's lounge and you know, there's like... Pittsburgh's worst nightmares, all the smoke in the room. Um, uh, but eventually we realized that was a stupid idea, and so we all quit smoking. Yeah. Um, the, the, the point I'm making is there's a huge gulf between what you know and what you may decide to do. And part of it was our culture. Every, all the doctors were smoking at those times. Our patients could smoke in bed as long as the oxygen wasn't flowing. Um, oh, wow. And eventually the culture just kind of caught up with us and we thought, all right, enough is enough, let's stop. That's, that was a generation ago. Now we're ex at exactly the same place. We know that food causes heart attacks. We know it causes diabetes. We know it's leading to obesity. We know all these things. Um, and we know it's killing our children. You know, the next generation is in trouble um, when, when we imagine what's going to befall them. But that doesn't necess necessarily lead to change for everybody. That's the negative side. The positive side is more people than ever 
are interested in changing their diets, they're doing it whether it's for their health, for the animals, for the environment, for their pocketbook, whatever the reason is, they are doing it. So just like the thin end, end of the wedge brought smoking really to its knees, that's what's happening with diet right now. Um, you can't yeah. uh, talk to anybody about food without finding somebody who's doing a vegan diet or vegetarian diet or they're, they're coming that direction, whereas even a year or two ago, that wasn't the case. I agree with you, but I want to push you a little harder because when I was smoking, when you were smoking, I didn't, maybe I should have, and I would have stopped earlier, but I didn't go in and, and get a scan of my lungs and see that they were right. starting to deteriorate, right? So I'm talking to the, about the people... I'm trying to understand behavior and the people that you work with um, and see as patients who have themselves arteriosclerosis but don't want to make a change. Is it because they just would rather take a pill or what do they say to you? What's yeah. their oh, barrier? No, I, I don't think they'd rather take a pill. I, I don't think so. Um, you do hear people, you hear doctors say that. Uh, I can't tell you how many doctors say, oh, my patients are lazy. They'd rather just pop mm. a pill. I got to tell you, I don't think that's true for anybody. I don't think there is any patient who wouldn't take their pills and throw them all in the trash yeah. if they thought that they could do an easy diet change that would make them unnecessary. I really think that's the case. I think part of it, though, is um, foods are, can I use the word addictive? Yeah. Um, that's true for certain things, and it's not true for, for other foods. Um, strawberries. We like a strawberry, but nobody ever binged on six cases of strawberries. Um, it's different for sugar or cheese or chocolate or meat, whereas people jump in these things and they overdose them on them and they hide, just like a typical addiction, um, what they're doing, um, and they do it despite what the dangerous effects that it has. Mm -hmm. And they start bargaining with it. Our research participants come in. They, we put them on vegan diets. Their diabetes improves dramatically. Sometimes it goes away. But there's a little devil on their shoulder that says, remember cheese? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> wasn't, that a, wasn't that a delightful thing? And they start compromising with their diet to see how much they can get away with. And then their diabetes comes roaring back, and they realize they can't fool around with it at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's partly the addictive um, power of foods. It's partly mm -hmm. culture that our culture lures us in. Uh, back to these things, but we create, and, and you, you're creating with this, um, a, a culture, or what sure seems like a culture, of people who are going in a healthier direction that people want to join. So tell us about how you approach your patients in terms of change and encouraging them to change, uh, even when it will save their life. There's some scary statistic, like one out of 10 are the, will make the change mm. even when they know that it's going to kill them if they stay the same. Uh, what have you encountered in, in, your, in your work? And Oh, yeah. Uh, I, it's a great question. It's, it's the central question, really, Alexandra. But I, I, yeah. to tell you the truth, I'm much more optimistic than, than that. Um, and here's the way we do it. We, we have a clinic right, right over there. Um, it's called the Barnard Medical Center. And patients come in, and about half of them know who we are. And they come here because they want the nutritional part. Okay. The other half we're just in their insurance plan. So they got diabetes, they come here, they see one of our doctors or the nurse practitioner. And what happens is you don't confront their skepticism. You just have to explain you've got diabetes and this is caused by something you probably haven't heard before. It's caused by the buildup of fat inside your muscle and liver cells and that stops your insulin from working anymore. And the patient says, what? And right. you have to explain it again. And once you've explained it, they, they, they get it. And the doctor then has to say, Here's why we're going to suggest a plant-based diet without a lot of added grease. And you don't confront the skepticism. You just lay out your case. Then when you're done, uh, you say, the dietician is right there. Would you like to meet with the dietician? Okay. And you can bring your <laughs> reluctant spouse too. So they sit down together and they make out a menu and they talk about the foods that a person would do well eating. Mm -hmm. And they take a half hour or an hour to do it. And then the patient says, I, I'm not sure if I can do this well. Why don't you come back Monday? We got a free class for you. It's 6 o'clock Monday night. And the patient can come to our classes for free forever with their family. And so you've got all the elements of change. And at no point do you ever say, you're wrong, you've had a terrible diet or anything like that. We say, here is the diet that we'd like to encourage you to try. And after about three weeks, their lives are just changed. Um, they, they, they try it out. We really encourage them. We, we follow with them every single week and it's super, super, super easy. Now, if they goof up, 
that's okay. You know, there has never been a person who quit smoking, quit a drug habit, quit an alcohol habit yeah. without probably goofing up 600 times before they finally got clean. And that's true with food too, especially with food, because there's temptation everywhere. But our doctors are like good coaches. They believe in everybody. So they never moralize. Um, but they just say, let's dust ourselves off and get back on, on the uh, a healthy approach. And so people here go vegan all the time. And if you're in Washington, D.C. ever, I want you to come by and see it. Every Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, I've got my conference room full of patients or members of the public who come in or research participants. They're all embracing this. And it's not rocket science. It's easy to do. And the seeming challenges just so, melt away. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, inter I'm interested in that very, very, very easy um, because that's a big barrier for people. They think, oh, no, no, I can't even think of three vegan meals that I could possibly yeah. <laughs> eat. And I don't want to, I want right. variety. Right. You, it sounds like you give support and you give clear alternatives to the food that they like and you do follow up. Are those the components of how to help yeah. somebody change? For mm -hmm. those of us who don't have the good luck to be in Washington, D.C., Okay, well, let's say we get to the, to the class phase, um, but you can, do this, you can do this at home too. Um, I break the change down into two, two steps or really three. The first step is why do you want to change? Um, and it's good to identify that. I would like my diabetes to go away um, or okay. to improve, or I don't want to have that heart attack, or uh, I have a painful condition. Uh, um, a person's got migraine headaches, um, or they've got menstrual cramps, and they never heard that a diet might help with that. Um, so we, the why is important. Then step two is take seven days. And during the seven-day period, you're not going to take anything out of your diet. What you're going to do <coughs> is check out the possibilities. So what could I have for breakfast? I, and I give the patient, or, and, and people can do this at home too, take a piece of paper, write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, give yourself some space under each heading, and take seven days and pencil things in. So every day of my life, I'm having cornflakes with um, cow's milk. I never tried almond milk or rice milk or soy milk or hemp milk or whatever. Now's your chance. Try it. You're not getting rid of anything, but you're trying the new options. Um, every day I go to the taco restaurant and I have a meat taco smothered with cheese. Well, now this time I'm going to try the bean burrito. Hold the cheese. Um, so all you're doing for the first seven days is checking out the possibilities. That's step two. Step three, once you know what the possibilities are and you found things you like, now Step three is do three weeks, all vegan, all plant-based, whatever your word is, no okay. animal products for three weeks, do it really well, but, it, but it's easy because it's only three weeks and you already identified the food you like. And at the end of those three weeks, two things have happened. Physically, people are changing. They're skinnier, they're, their blood Doesn't sugars are coming down, their energy is better, their digestion is finally sorting itself out. But the other thing is their tastes are adapting and they found foods that they like. And they're, they're kind of thinking, maybe I don't really need that double bacon, cheeseburger, greasy junk um, that makes me feel kind of rotten. So they didn't expect that in advance, but they discover their tastes really are transforming just as their health is transforming. So just like you were in the film Super Size Me, weren't you? <clears throat> yes. Ken Spurlock <laughs> changed his, cameo. <laughs> his, his health in, in, a, in a 30 days drastically, but to the worse, like major, right. major. Now you're saying that people can change their health for the better, major, major, uh, by adopting a plant-based diet. It's astounding. Um, I guess we're known for our diabetes work, but there are people here who, we see them every day, who say, I've got diabetes up and down my family tree, and I knew it was going to happen to me, and it probably means I'll go blind someday or I'm going to lose a foot. Um, you know, th this is what they expect. And nobody ever told them the real cause of it. So we explore that cause. And, and, and for your listeners, this is going to be a totally new thing when I say that type 2 diabetes comes from the buildup of fat particles in the muscle and liver cells. They've never heard that before. They thought that they got that from drinking soda. Um, and by the way, I'm not saying soda is health food. It's not. Even if it is Dr. Pepper, it's not health food. <laughs> but, uh, but, but it doesn't um, contribute to diabetes. Is that what you're saying? I am saying that the cause of type 2 diabetes is it's the buildup of fat particles inside the liver cells and muscle cells causes insulin resistance, so the insulin doesn't work anymore. And once that happens, if you have a soda or you have bread or anything, your blood sugar is always going to rise because, because it, the sugar can't get into the cells. But how the, does sugar it... was, the sugar wasn't the cause. It's a symptom of it. Got it. I want to understand oh. how it causes insulin resistance. Like, go deeper. 
Okay. So, um, your muscle helps. cells work on glucose. Glucose is a good thing. Sugar is a good thing. Right. In the right. same way as your I car runs on gas. Your car runs on gasoline. Your cells run on glucose. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, before a race, what do people do? They want a lot of glycogen in their liver and in their muscle cells. So they're carbo loading leading up to, to that race. Uh, that glucose is all good. The, the only problem in diabetes is the glucose isn't getting into the muscle cells. It's staying out in the bloodstream. Why can't it get into the muscle cells? Because the muscles are filled with fat. Um, these are, t- and I don't mean to say that you've got a lot of belly fat or thigh fat or anything. It's, it's fat inside the muscle cells themselves and also in the liver cells. And if the fat builds up, it's like chewing gum in your front door lock. You just can't make your key work anymore. So if the, if the fat from um, cheese pizza or fried chicken or whatever, that fat gets into the cells, that stops insulin from being able to get the glucose inside. So a vegan diet has how much animal fat? Zero. And if I keep oils really low, the fat drains out of the cells. And once that happens, then the glucose can get out of the blood into the cell where it belongs. Your blood sugar goes down. Your doctor says, holy cow, this is amazing. Um, We need to back off on your insulin dose. And if all goes well, the the diabetes improves or goes away. Mm -hmm. And the sooner a person starts this kind of diet, I mean, you're diagnosed with diabetes today and you start it today. you got a really good shot at getting rid of your diabetes altogether. Now, when you say fat, is there a difference between animal fat and plant-based fat? Like avocados ah, great, and hemp great, great question. Um, I think the worst actors are what we call saturated fat. Um, that's the fat that's, especially in, in cheese and other dairy products, that's the biggest source, uh, also in meat. But let me also say it's, it's also in coconut, uh, coconut and palm oils, very high in saturated fat, too. Um, so the saturated fat is probably the worst actor. But, but if I have a person who's got type 2 diabetes, I'm going to keep all oils to a minimum. Uh, we're going to get rid of animal fats for sure. But I'm going to keep vegetable oils pretty low as well because I want to drain that fat out of their cells. And I also want to help them lose weight. And when, they get, when, they, when they're eating grains and vegetables and fruits and, and beans, the weight loss is a lot easier than if... It's a guacamole fest every day. You know what I'm talking about. So, right. So oil, but <laughs> also those before. but also coconut in its pure form and nuts and avocado. Do you also limit those or do you remove them completely f- from a diabetic for, for a diet? young for a young skinny healthy person? Um, I think it's I, I I think it's perfectly fine to have say an ounce a day of nuts, especially something like walnuts or almonds, where it's really they're a good source of vitamin E. There's a little bit of omega three in there. I think that's all fine. Uh, by the way, mm-hmm. one word about this. Um, if you take and you pour, an ounce, uh, pour some nuts into the palm of your hand, once it hits your fingers, it's more than an ounce. Okay. So stop at that point. And then, very important, don't eat them because if you do, you know what happens is you're going to fill your hand again because nuts are addicting too, especially if they're salted and spiced up. And you know what they do with the 7-Eleven. So um, <laughs> what I do instead is I crumble the nuts up and I put them on my salad or my pancakes or, or whatever it is, I use it as, as a flavoring rather than a primary food. Um, if people overdo it on nuts, they're, they're going to tend to to gain weight or have trouble losing weight. You know what I found, though, is when you do the raw nuts, and they're not like the 7-Eleven brand, right, with all the spices and the stuff and the salt and the roast and it, just raw, I never overeat those. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's and just... Exactly. You know, because you're not tricking yourself with no. all kinds of salt and spice. Or, I don't know, if, like, I'll often mix them with, say, banana or something. So you have a few uh, almonds, and for me, it just is a nice combination. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm one who will... Can can eat four tablespoons of nut butter just woo, and I and I get the natural <laughs> with no salt or anything and I don't know if it's raw and I don't think it's raw but I'd still eat it if it was raw so I need to follow your advice uh, Dr. Barnard thank you <laughs> um, that's really interesting about diabetes you mentioned addiction yeah. several times um, can you talk about addictive foods uh, I know you wrote a book called the cheese trap and oh. I know that cheese is a huge issue. Dotsie and I both confront this, and I'm sure you do too. I don't want to give up cheese. And you yeah. have a reason for that. You've, you've decoded it. It's not just because cheese is yummy. And it's not because people are weak, because that's how right. people I'll, feel. I'll tell you. It's, it, it's the most amazing thing. In, in our, uh, a number of years ago, the federal government, the, the National Institutes of Health, funded our team to do a diabetes research study with a vegan diet. And people did great. But despite how great they did, I kept hearing some people say, I still miss cheese. 
I thought, how can you miss this, this food that, that caused weight gain and caused you to have diabetes? I don't know. I just miss it. I crave it. Um, and then as people go back to it, their weight problems come back. And it reminded me, the way people would talk about cheese was the way an alcoholic would remember their, their last drink mm -hmm. with this tremendous fondness. So, so here's what I did. I genotyped all of our research participants. I, I took blood samples. I sent them to UCLA. And I looked for a certain gene. And what we found is that half of our patients with diabetes happen to have a single gene that caused them to have low dopamine activity. Dopamine is the pleasure chemical in the brain, and they weren't getting much dopamine activity, so what were they doing? They were eating their way into it. Um, alcohol or drugs of abuse cause dopamine release, and so people who have not much dopamine activity tend to get into addictions, but one of those addictions can be food. But it's not just any food. You don't eat 12 oranges or three apples. What people want is sugar, chocolate, cheese, or some guys particularly, it's meat, or sometimes it's combinations like um, salty, greasy things together like French fries. Um, so that's where cheese comes in. Cheese has more salt ounce per ounce than potato chips. Wow. It's 70% fat, so it's salty and greasy. Yeah. But worst of all, it's got um, pre-made opiates in it. They're called casomorphins. They are opiate chemicals coated in the dairy protein but concentrated in cheese and when you eat the cheese they go to the brain and they attach to the same brain receptors as heroin would attach to they're not as strong but they're strong enough to make you want that cheese and that always freaks people out they're like why why is there morphine in my cheese like that doesn't make any sense and it makes all the sense in the world there's also casomorphine in, in my human mother's milk that I drank for two years. Why is it in there? What is it for? Because it's really quite beautiful. The reason that it is in milk and then, wait a minute, why shouldn't we be having it? Because we're addicted. But <laughs> If you look at the face of a nursing baby, they are so intent. And then after they nurse, they collapse into sleep. Um, and if... if, if if a baby didn't want to nurse, didn't like to nurse, or let's say it's a baby cow, a, a, a calf. Let's say the calf said, Mom, not interested in nursing today. I'm going to wander in the woods. The calf would not do well. So Mother Nature doesn't like to take chances. So in, in breast milk, there's not only protein and fat and some cholesterol and a few hormones and some other things, but there's also a little bit of feel good. The casein protein that's in milk, including human milk, when it breaks apart, it releases these natural mild opiates. They're not, they're not that strong. Um, the most potent one is called morphoseptin. It has about one-tenth the brain binding power compared to pharmacy-grade morphine. So okay. not, enough to get, not enough to get you arrested, but right. just enough to make you think that was a wonderful experience. And, and so it's kind of a biological substrate of the mother-infant bond. The, 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 the baby bonds to, to mom as a result of this. Do we have... Is this correct that in a liter of cow's milk, there's 26, about 26 grams of casein, and then our human mother breast milk, there's about three? So we, we, uh, we, we see that difference. It's like, wow, that's so much more than we were ever supposed to even get as infants, and now we're adults drinking the cows. Um, yes. Uh, d milk is species-specific. And so for, for to, to make a cow, <laughs> which requires, as you know, um, very enormously rapid growth. It's, it's different from humans who grow up really quite, quite gradually and quite slowly. In fact, if they're breastfed, they grow up slower than if they're on a formula. Mm -hmm. So Mother Nature said, okay, take your time. We want your life to be long. We want a really long uh, breastfeeding period. Take, uh, take your time through adolescence, and hopefully your life will be long. Um, so, so breast milk is, is different, but it does have the casomorphins in it nonetheless. And cheese, of course, is concentrated milk, so that's why well, people exactly. love cheese. And also, it has a lot of, as you said, salt and fat, two other dopamine, what do you call it, dopamine releasers? Do do I don't do know. Yeah, we call them dopamine agonists, or dopamine releasers. Yeah, you're right. Cheese is sort of dairy crack. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's the, the ultimate addicti addictive uh, dairy. You wrote a book called Power Foods for the Brain, and tell us a little bit about that because you talk about Alzheimer's and the connection between diet and Alzheimer's, which is something that I think most people are not talking about. No. Well, that's why I wrote this. Um, I have to tell you, when my grandpa started to um, repeat stories, 
And then he couldn't recognize uh, other people anymore. And then it got to the point where he just sat in the corner of the nursing home year after year after year, not knowing anybody or anything that ever mattered to him. And then my father uh, discovered the same thing was happening to him. And he was terrified. And there was nothing he could do to stop it. And when he died, his, his heart stopped beating, but his life had ended for all intents and purposes four or five years before. Mm -hmm. The If you make a list of all the things you don't want to have happen to you, Alzheimer's is like number one. Mm -hmm. And researchers in Chicago tackled this, and, and other research teams have tackled this, looking at, at foods that people eat who don't get Alzheimer's. And they found several things. Um, we've been talking about saturated fat that's bad for your heart. People who tend to avoid that cut their risk of Alzheimer's dramatically. The trans fats that are in a lot of junk foods, if people who avoid those do well. People who have vitamin E rich foods, here's your almonds again, tend to be protected. People who tend to eat green vegetables like spinach or the cruciferous vegetables, um, for them, uh, according to the, a research study called the Memory and Aging uh, Project, what they found was that the aging of the brain was delayed by 11 years. Um, so anyway, each one of these is important but you put them all together. And if you avoid the bad things and you bring in the good things and lace up your sneakers, that's part of it too. Yeah. Because yeah. if you exercise and you oxygenate the brain and get the crud out, um, I honestly think that while we might, might not end, Alzheimer, end Alzheimer's disease completely, I think we can greatly delay or eliminate probably 80% of it if we put all these things to work. And now is the time to make this happen. It is not all age and genetics. It relates to things that we can control. And it's, I don't want to oversimplify it, but what I'm hearing is, you know, there's a, has a big part to do with uh, reversing some diseases simply by increasing blood flow and um, allowing your endothelial cells to run freely and healthfully. That is helpful for an athlete to pr produce a premium performance. It's all helpful. It's all helpful for guys who are having erectile dysfunction. They don't right. have great blood flow. And so they take Viagra, which is increases blood flow. But we've seen so many changes when guys switch over to a plant-based diet. And it sounds to me like if we don't have good blood flow to our brain, well, eventually, parts of it would, would, would die off, go to sleep. What, what happens to the brain if we don't get that oxygenation and that blood flow? Right. The, the cells actually die. Okay. Um, and and it, if you get this early, um, there's, there's a, a, a preliminary condition called mild cognitive impairment. And you're still yourself. Let's say you're up in years. You're still yourself. You might be driving. You might manage your checkbook. But you discover you cannot remember especially names and words. Like, what was the name of that actor in that movie? I know it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. And, and this will happen to all of us. You know, if you didn't sleep well last night, this will happen. Okay, but phew. I was like, oh, no, that happens to me all the time. <laughs> it happens to everybody. But if, if it's every day without, throughout the day, mm -hmm. that's mild cognitive impairment. If that person says, I'm terrified, I, I know where this is going, you, you take that person, you change their diet, you lace up their sneakers, you get them doing a brisk walk three times a week. Um, what research studies have shown is the hippocampus of the brain, that's the seat of memory, it actually has been shrinking year by year, it starts to expand. It goes back to, to toward where it was. Uh, people do much better on paper and pencil tests as a result of getting that regular exercise, which oxygenates the brain, and eating the healthful foods. What, if you could get into your bloodstream, after a person has a cheese sandwich, um, the particles of saturated fat make the blood viscous. That's, it's thick. Mm -hmm. It doesn't flow well. You don't oxygenate well. Get that out of your diet so that your blood can flow more like water, less like grease. And suddenly, not only your muscles oxygenate, so you've got better athletic endurance mm -hmm. and better recovery, but also your brain is getting oxygenated. So you don't want that junk in your bloodstream because it goes to your brain. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing mm -hmm. that, you are, that you're advocating for a low-fat diet, but I understand. Doctors, a lot of people go, oh, I have to take my, even my mom actually, saw my mom last week, and she said, <laughs> we, were, we were in the store, and she said, I'm going to buy my fish oil now, and I said, I'm going over here, mom, you sure there's algae, you know, the fish eat algae, you don't need to eat fish to get the, whatever, the DHA and things like that, T talk to us about this, this push for fish oil for our brain, not only from a uh, uh, plant-based point of view, but also the fats. I'm hearing you say that maybe no fats are good, but on the other hand, isn't DHA, aren't there good fats for our brain? 
Yeah, okay, very important. You do need traces of fats in your diet, um, and you need, their, their, their technical terms are alpha-linolenic acid and linoleic acid. This will not be on the test. Um, <laughs> but but they're, in, they're in plant foods, and you need them, and your body will take the alpha-linolenic acid, and it will um, expand, it will lengthen the molecule to make DHA, and your brain needs the DHA. Now, for a lot of folks, they're eating all kinds of other fats. And those other fats occupy the enzymes that we're going to lengthen the, the, the uh, molecule so they, they don't get much DHA. So they go to the store and they eat fish oil. And the fish oil does have some DHA in it as well as lots of other fats in it. But what you said, Alexander, is exactly right, that right next to the fish oil capsules are the vegan DHA, uh, which is sourced from algae. Um, it's cleaner. It doesn't make you smell. Um, now, the question is whether that helps or not, whether anybody needs it or not. With regard to fish oil, frankly, the, it, the research hasn't been supportive of fish oil. Um, it started out with heart disease, and fish oil really doesn't do much of anything um, for heart disease at all, probably doesn't reduce stroke. And the question is, would it do something for the brain? And I don't really know. But the, my, my thought is, if you want to take DHA, by all means, take the, the botanical version. It's the cleanest, purest one you're ever going to get. Um, and secondly, if you wish to, you can test. Mm -hmm. You go online and you, you can do a DHA blood test. They'll send you a little card. You prick your finger and you put a dot on a blood on the card. You mail it in and a week or so later, they'll send you your results. And if you're in the good range, you leave it alone. If you're low, you can take DHA if you wish to. Um, we don't yet know if any of that part will really help, but that's kind of where the science is. And some people are supplementing for that reason and it may well be okay for them. Good information. Thank you. That, yeah. I'm going to call Go, my sure. mom after this. <laughs> yes, and yeah, exactly. listen to this too. Yeah. And by the way, these Go. are all online. You don't have to go to the store for them. If you go online and you Google, you know, vegan DHA, there's like a million yeah, people are. who yeah. are making yeah. this now yeah. because people think, I mean, A, they don't want the fish because of the smell or they don't want it because it's environmental. It, it, let's face it, it's not sustainable. And or they think, you know, leave the poor fish alone. Whatever their motivation is, people are going toward plants. Um, and there's every reason to do that. Yeah, I mean, we forget. What do the fish eat? What do these animals eat that right. are so big and strong right. or healthy, Elephants et cetera? Elephants and horses. And what, going back to um, diabetes and, uh, for the most part, diabetes, I mean, heart disease too, but I don't understand why there isn't more research on this that shows us that it is the fat in our cells. I mean, yeah. what, what is going on? Um, the disconnect is not that there's not research. There's a huge amount of research. The disconnect is between the research and public consciousness. Um, and the reason I say that is we have been working with Yale University. Jerry Shulman and Kit Peterson are pioneers in this area. And Jerry Shulman just recently received the highest award that the American Diabetes Association can give. And what he has done it is our, our patients go vegan here in Washington, D.C., they get on the Amtrak train and they go up to New Haven, Connecticut, and they go into an MR spectroscopy machine mm -hmm. and we measure the fat inside their cells. And you can see it. And so anyway, there have been many, many, many studies that have shown very, very clearly that the buildup of fat inside the muscle and liver cells is the whole reason insulin is not working. Um, the problem is that it's much easier for people to say, uh, it's got to be the sugar. Part of that is scapegoating. Um, again, I'm not saying sugar is health food. It's not. It's junk. You don't need it at all, and it, it is addictive, and it's particularly fattening if you bake it into a cookie with a lot of butter. Um, uh -huh. But um, the, it, it, the reason I'm concerned about this is if people are only avoiding sugar, they're not tackling the disease in the way they really need to tackle it. And uh -huh. if the next generation is going to go up without diabetes, they've got to do a whole lot more than skip the Coke. That's a good idea, but they need to go much further. And they skip fruit yeah. too, which they which but they like shouldn't the, do. The Diabetes Association doesn't talk about getting the pork chop off your plate. You know, if you look at populations that follow vegan diets, I'm talking about, for example, um, among Seventh Day Adventists, which has been a wonderful sure. um, natural experiment because their church teachings say follow a healthy diet. So for some, they're meat eaters; some they're fish eaters; some they're vegetarians or vegans. It's astounding. The more you get toward a vegan diet the healthier the body mass index. I mean, yeah. you know, they're, they're in a healthy body weight. And the difference in diabetes statistics between the people who have gone to a vegan diet versus the people sticking with meat, it's astounding. The vegans have very, very little diabetes. The meat eaters have, have a lot. So anyhow, 
um, our research team has shown that no matter how old you are, when you go toward this kind of way of eating, um, it can cause diabetes to improve. Uh, in some cases, it's just no longer there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear of people going on the keto. Keto is high fat, right? And paleo is higher protein. Is, I'm, uh, anyway, keto, paleo, and right. they do it to try and lower their blood sugars. Um, yes, and you can sort of understand why. Because with a ketogenic diet, there's, basic, there's practically no carbohydrate in it. And it, let's say a person is very insulin resistant. Their cells are filled with fat, and at that point, if you just don't eat any bread at all and you don't eat any carbohydrates, your blood sugar isn't going to rise because you're not providing any glucose into the system. But that wasn't the cause of it. They're not looking systemically is what right. you're saying. They're, they're not looking exactly. Patching. And once okay. they introduce those foods, whoop, they're, you can really see how uh, insulin resistant they are. Right. Right, and, and so that convinces them that sugar was the problem. As soon as they had bread or sugar, their blood sugar went up through the roof. But what I say is, wait a minute, why can you not have a piece of fruit or some bread or some pasta? It's the problem is inside your cells. So we use a low-fat plant-based diet, and for the first couple of days, their blood sugar might rise a little bit because they're eating more carbs and their cells are filled with fat. But by about day three or four or five, their blood sugar starts to turn, and it starts going down and down and down. And if they're on medications, they need less and less and less. And I, by the way, I encourage people to work with their doctors because the doctor's going to need to back you off your medication at the right time, and which, of course, the patients love to get off their medications, but mm -hmm. you want to do, do it smartly. Is there something that, that they should be looking at then rather or in addition to their A1C? Is there, is uh, well, there the something? A1C is a good measure of your blood sugar control, right. but everything else goes, gets better with it. Look at the number on the scale. Um, that's going to move. Um, your cholesterol is going to change, your blood pressure will change, all these things get better. And as you said, Dotsie, um, for men, erectile dysfunction very often goes away. And it's the coolest thing to see these guys, they come into our studies. Yeah. Um, I remember years ago we were doing a study uh, for late stage diabetes, people who had neuropathic pain, meaning their nerves had been assaulted by this disease. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know. Is that like fibromyalgia? It's like your life. Sorry? Is that fibromyalgia? The neuropathic um, pain? Is that uh, no, um, fibromyalgia is where you have pain in your muscles. Oh, okay. But uh, for people who have had late-stage diabetes, their fingers tingle and yeah. hurt uh, or go numb, and their feet hurt, and they can't feel things anymore, and it's just a miserable condition. So, But what we found is that a plant-based diet helps that too. And in the course mm -hmm. of these studies, we have the guys around the room saying, you wouldn't believe the surprise I had this morning. Uh, <laughs> Yay! You know what they're talking about. <laughs> we didn't tell them that was going to happen. Um, and I'm not sure if that's good news or bad news for their wives, but, but, um, but this, uh, this happens quite predictably. Well, that's, that's, a, that's uh. a very important point to make because I think that's something that's not discussed, and erectile yeah. dysfunction is, a, is a, a common, more common than it should be in our, in our country. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. I want to talk well, about Alexander, let, let, me, let me pick up on that point just real quick. Yeah. I am gonna, let, me, let me go so far as to say that if a guy, he's 55 years old, he goes to the doctor and he says, I'm having a little trouble with my uh, nature, I'm going to say that if the doctor writes out a prescription for Viagra and leaves it at that, that that doctor has just done a, made a terrible mistake. Because a guy with erectile dysfunction in midlife, he doesn't just have narrowings in his, uh, in, in his private parts. He's got artery narrowings in his heart. He's got artery narrowings to his brain. He's at very, very high risk for stroke or, or heart attack. So what the doctor should say is, I can give you some Viagra for tonight if you want. But let's talk about what you are eating. Let's make sure you crush out the cigarettes. Let's protect your blood vessels and then Hopefully, you're not going to need the Viagra at all. But what you got to think about is the heart and the brain. Um, that's what yeah. uh, is being assaulted by this. That's a, so, so basically, the, the erect penis is the canary in the coal mine. Is that what you're saying? That is exactly it. Or the not erect penis. we gotta talk, We got to talk about it directly, <laughs> you guys. You can't shy away from it. I want to talk about the McLibel uh, suit in the United Kingdom that you, you testified in because I, I found it very interesting when I heard you speak about it. Can you talk about that case, what it was about? Yes. Uh, McDonald's is not necessarily the purveyor of healthy, ethical fare. And so, <laughs> oh, they um, sponsor the International Olympic Committee, though. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Good Lord. Um, I know. I got <laughs> William Costelli, who was hospitals. the head of the Framingham Heart Study, used to always say, when you see the golden arches, you're on the road to the pearly gates. <laughs> and i got to say, that was true. Um, so anyway, 
uh, in in London, some protesters went outside. Not really protesters. They they were just leafleting outside of McDonald's. They were saying this is anti-environmental. It's unhealthy. Okay. It it can increase your risk of heart problems and cancer and so forth. So McDonald's, the, the legal system is a little bit different in the UK. McDonald's sued these people um, for for libel, and all, all of them apologized. They said, just drop the case. We apologize. We're sorry. We were leafleting, except for two. Mm. There were two protesters who said, we are not apologizing. What we are saying is true. And McDonald's brought them into court, and they were in court in the longest civil trial in English history. What? And they called me and said, would I come and speak on their behalf? And so I did, and um, I went to London, and frankly, McDonald's is unhealthy. Um, and it was, a, anyway, long story short, these, these were, I think, heroic young people who were able to speak out for the truth and were willing to stand up for what they believed in. And what happened? Did they prevail or what, yeah. was, the, what was the end result of this tr- suit? Um, the judge, wig and all, um, yielded <laughs> uh, a mixed verdict okay. saying that in certain things they were telling the truth and in other things they, they ought to, to not exaggerate for McDonald's. So it was a bit of a mixed verdict, but I have to say, <laughs> um, for McDonald's, it was a crushing defeat because yeah. they thought yeah. that they could just throw their weight around and sue everybody and stop them, and uh, they can't. And um, here in, in Washington, uh, about a month ago, uh, McDonald's was giving away, it was bacon hour. You could get free bacon on anything, really? bacon on your burger, bacon on your ice cream, bacon in your soda if you wanted it. And so we brought out um, a whole bunch of doctors with signs where we turned the um, arches on their side so it looked like two C's, and we wrote colorectal cancer and stood outside uh, the McDonald's and stopped passersby. Um, We've done lots of things to try to encourage them. Now, I have nothing against them as a company. If they would clean up and stop serving unhealthy things and unethical things and serve healthy plant-based foods, we'd all embrace them. We can go to Mickey D's back. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It took me a long time to... Really? I did. Wow. Strange. I remember I worked in the drive-thru. I was 20, 21. And I remember them pulling out the stainless steel drawers that were filled with hardened animal fat. And they would scoop it out like with an ice scooper and dump it into the French fry fryer. Mm. And that's when I was like... It, it, just just like you did before when you um, talked about the ribs. I still right. ate the rest of McDonald's, but I never had a fry again because it just was so intense and visceral and real. That is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen, and I couldn't eat one ever again. I'm learning so much about Dotsie on this interview. <laughs> <The> smoking, <laughs> the working at McDonald's, it's great. Shady past. <laughs> um, oh. Both of you have produce commercials that have been uh, anti-dairy, oh, in Dotsie's case, is an anti-dairy commercial, and PCRM has also produced commercials. Uh, how, what kind of effect does that have, encouraging people for a plant-based diet and explaining to people how unhealthy meat and dairy can be? What kind of effect does that have? Personally, I just love them um, because, let's, let's face it, people, if you just go on, on camera and say, let me explain this to you, um, sometimes it works, um, and I've done commercials just like that, um, where I try earnestly to explain to the, the listening audience that what they eat matters. But there's nothing like using a little bit of humor or a little bit of artsiness. And one of my favorites actually was about McDonald's. We had uh, the doctor um, comforting the grieving widow, and there is the dead man on a slab. And the camera pans around, and as he goes by, you see still gripping in his hand is this half-eaten burger. <laughs> And and then then the camera goes around and sees the man's feet standing up there like this. And then you see the arches tracing over the top. And and it flashes on the screen, I was loving it. Um, Very clever. I like um, your bacon causes butt cancer one the most. um, That was a good one, too. (laughs) There's lots of ways to make fun of our future (laughs) friends at McDonald's. So Uh, people can go to the PCRM website to see some of those? You'll see those. You'll see them on YouTube okay. as well. Great. So I, I, I know back in your career, the American Medical Association initially took um, issue with you speaking out against not eating animal um, right. products and also experimentation. And over the years, I guess you would say they kind of relented because um, now you're an active AMA member, um, very much so. And I, 
am getting to know you and have seen you speak many times, and I am learning that you are an eternal optimist and a glasses half full type of person. Um, and you started a PCRM in, in 1985, and I started Switch for Good seven months ago. And I would love some advice to have endurance in this movement, in this, uh, um, this strife and that is, as you well know, uh, can get you down every single day, but only if you let it. Um, but to be able to speak up for human health, um, loud and proud, and for a really long time until we don't need to, to anymore, hopefully. The, um, well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, Dotsy. Um, back after World War I, when, the, when the, frankly, Europe was destroyed, um, there were people who thought, we have to find a better way of solving conflicts. Mm -hmm. And they were working toward the League of Nations, which became the United Nations. And, and somebody said to a, one of the diplomats, you're setting this up. Are, are you an optimist? Uh, is this going to work? Or maybe you're a pessimist. He said, I'm not either one of those. I'm determined. Mm. So it's not a question of predicting whether you're going to succeed or not. You just have to be determined um, to do everything you can to make it succeed. Now, from my standpoint, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, because whether it's advocating for human health or the health of the next generation, the health of all the animals who I have to say I personally was involved with, uh, kind of on the wrong side of the gun um, way back when, mm. uh, or the survival of the earth itself, my feeling is um, we just have to be determined. That said, look at what has happened. Back when we got started, uh, when I first went, first vegetarian, then vegan, a health food store was a tiny little place playing folk music. The cashier was named Sunshine. The, the um, shelves were filled with dusty products that nobody wanted. Look today. Health food stores are enormous. People are flocking in to buy things, and they'll pay top dollar for them because they want healthy food. The word, there, there's a, a, a little store downstairs. I walked in. The first display said, go vegan. Um, <laughs> it's not a vegan store, but they know that's what sells. So people are going to this like crazy. And athletes like you, Dotsie, and, and you, Alexandra, you know, you've shown you, you, you've been ahead of your time. But people are following your lead in all the major sports saying, that's where we are. That bodes well for the future. So, yes, there's going to be always people who would disagree. Don't worry about it. That's kind of the way all, we, all, all addictions sort themselves out. And, yes, it's true the AMA at first said, no, you need meat. But then they decided, wait a minute, maybe you don't need meat. Um, maybe we're better off having plant-based meals in hospitals and in schools and in food assistance programs. Those are official AMA policies now and a lot more to come. So we just got to make it uh, as fast as possible, pedal to the metal. Let's bring that revolution as, uh, as soon as we can. And Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine is, is just so you, you all just do so, so much incredible work. And a lot of it's because you have science to back you and Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine does PCRM, everybody. Uh, join. It's an amazing, amazing group. Advocates for human health and, and, and for animals, too, for all those animals being dissected in medical schools. And yeah. you all just do amazing work. So thank you. Thank you yeah. from the bottom of my heart. And I know Dotsie's, too, for everything that you've done. Thank and you. Well, we'll thanks do. for your advice. <laughs> oh, thanks. Right back at you. It's all a team effort. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.